My name's Aubrey de Grey. I'm a biomedical gerontologist based in Cambridge, and I'm the chairman and chief science officer of a foundation called the Methuselah Foundation. I'm interested in research to combat the process of aging in mammals and eventually in humans by biotechnological means. And I'm doing this because ultimately aging is very bad for you. It causes an immense amount of suffering and of course it kills 100,000 people a day, which is twice as many as everything else that kills anyone all added together. I think it's rather important to do this. I think that Old people are people too, so the fact that ageing only kills old people is not a reason not to be working on defeating it. You've been a primary exponent of really a comprehensive strategy for what we've called Bridge 2, which is reprogramming biology. Sometimes it's called biotechnology, but it's dealing with bio biology, using biological methods to identify ageing, ageing as you've articulated, it's not just one thing. There's a number of different processes, and we can reprogram them. We can re-engineer them using biological interventions. I think you're right to characterize it as part of Bridge 2 initially. But in fact, I think that the transition to your Bridge 3, where we're using predominantly non-biological technology, will actually be a continuous um, transition um, of improving the efficacy and comprehensiveness of these various therapies. So you've come up with uh, strategies for engineered negligible senescence, as you call it. So if you could articulate what that is and uh, give us an idea of what the different sources of aging are, and then we'll go through each one and talk about how we can reverse them and control them. So yes, as you say, I've broken these things down into a variety of categories. I normally list seven different categories of molecular and cellular change that occur throughout life and that are eventually bad for us. There's the loss of cells in various tissues that are not capable of replacing cells or not at an adequate rate anyway. There's the accumulation of cells, and here I'm not talking about cancer, I'm talking about cells that are not necessarily dividing, but they're also not dying when we'd like them to, and so they get in the way in various ways. Then there is the accumulation of mutations in our chromosomes, and that is certainly responsible for cancer. Then there are mutations in a special part of the cell called the mitochondrion, which is actually the only part of the cell other than our nucleus that has um, any of DNA of its own. Um, number five is the accumulation of indigestible molecules of various sorts inside the cell, and that causes various problems like atherosclerosis. It's involved in all of the various types of neurodegeneration, for example. Um, then there's, again, indigestible molecules, but this time outside the cell in the spaces between cells. This turns out normally to be proteinaceous material called amyloid, and it's uh, obviously well known in Alzheimer's disease. It's also a feature of diabetes and one or two other um, age-related problems. And then the final seventh one is, again, outside the cell. It's the accumulation of cross-links of new chemical bonds between long-lived proteins that have not uh, 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 just a sort of garbage role, but actually a structural role, things like the artery wall or the lens of the eye that need to be elastic in order to do their job and that become less elastic as a result of these extra cross-links. One really useful feature of this is that the various things that accumulate, these changes that accumulate, are occurring throughout life, but they're only seriously bad for us during the later part of life which tells us that there must be some sort of threshold abundance of these various types of damage, as I like to call them, um, below which metabolism can just sort of cope perfectly well. I mean, maybe one's peak performance declines, but one's ability to maintain normal performance, whether it be mental or physical, or the ability to fight infections or whatever, um, is more or less unimpaired. There's a big overlap between aging and disease. And, I mean, one disease process is atherosclerosis, which of course ends up, results in heart attacks and strokes, among other things, which of course kill people. But it's also an aging process. Even if people don't have heart attacks, their arteries filling up with both vulnerable and calcified plaques slows them down a lot. Uh, so this is a key aging process. Uh, where does this fit into your seven strategies? So you're absolutely right. I always like to point out that it's completely wrong to talk about aging itself and age-related diseases, that in fact age-related diseases are age-related because they are the later stages of aging. And atherosclerosis is probably the best example of this because the first clinically visible in the artery signs of atherosclerosis, the fatty streaks made up of foam cells, are actually visible in the aorta of kids. 
So way, way before any, um, anything that could normally be called aging has actually happened. So what's going on there is that particles of um, low-density lipoprotein especially are getting caught in the intimal space of the artery wall. And they just, you know, they get stuck, just, you know, stuff happens. And cells called monocytes that are circulating in the arteries infiltrate the artery wall and develop into a different type of cell called a macrophage, and they engulf this stuff, and they break it all down and get rid of it, almost. But unfortunately, there's a small proportion, perhaps about 2% of the material that macrophages in the artery walls engulf that they don't know how to me metabolize, simply because the material has undergone um, chemical modifications, oxidation especially. And the results of these oxidation reactions are chemicals that the body just doesn't have enzymes to process. So what I'd like to do is to enhance the degradation capacity of the macrophage and indeed of the human body in general by introducing new enzymes that we might find in other species. These new enzymes would of course, have to be made sure that they didn't do any harm and break down things that we didn't want to break down. But that shouldn't be too hard because enzymes are very specific, even if they do unusual things. So the idea is to find especially bacteria. We think there's a good chance of finding bacteria that can break down these unusual substances. And if they can, then we can not only preempt the development of an atherosclerotic plaque, but we can actually also cause existing plaques to regress because the acellular core, which is made up of the, mainly of these um, nasty oxidized substances, will, be, will shrink, and therefore the inflammatory signals that cause the hyperplasia of the vascular smooth muscle cells and so on will be removed, and the muscle cells themselves will um, become less angry, so to speak, and the plaque will shrink. Of course, one key issue, if you have therapies, you have to get them to the right place, which is usually our cells or some targeted cells. And it's actually quite a voyage from here to in inside your cells. Could you comment on that? It certainly is. And I think that this is a classic case of evolution being really smart and the smartest way for us to proceed in our current primitive technological state being to use evolution's tricks as much as possible. So, of course, the standard technique that most people are using for gene therapy, for getting genes into our bodies, is to use viruses which have evolved for that exact purpose. And, of course, the um, default mode of a virus is to be bad for us, but because viruses have such compact DNA, we can engineer that DNA. We can take out the particular genes that make the viruses bad for us and replace them with genes that we want to introduce into the cell. We can also use viruses and other related um, genetic tricks to actually alter the DNA that's already in our cells um, by a process called gene targeting, and that may be very important, especially for um, the, the approach that I think we're going to have to use to really, really cure cancer. One of the downsides of using viruses for gene therapy is it sometimes triggers the immune system. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done to minimize the um, effect on the immune system of quite a number of the therapies that I am interested in here. For example, the approach to, um, to combating atherosclerosis involves putting in new genes that the body's never seen. And it may be that this is best done by enzyme replacement therapy precisely because that turns out to have a very muted immune response, essentially because it doesn't get to the right part of the immune system. But um, there are ways also of manipulating the immune system, not just brutally by immune suppression, but by specifically making the immune system recognize one or two new proteins as self rather than as foreign, uh, the process called tolerization. And I think there's a lot of progress going to be made there. Another point to bear in mind is that some of the things that we need to introduce are proteins that can be expressed at very, very low levels. And we know that the immune system can... Um, essentially not notice them. Uh, telomerase is an example of a natural protein that we all make, but which you can still make vaccines against, uh, which actually work against cancers, because cancers are making so much of this stuff that it gets over the sort of threshold uh, into the radar of the immune system. Uh, one of the things that cancer cells do is they produce telomerase to extend their telomeres, which are these sort of aging beads, and the theory being that one of these little DNA beads falls off of time a cell replicates, and so the cell can only replicate a certain number of times. But cancer cells defeat that and become immortal, 
by producing this one enzyme, telomerase, that extends their telomeres. And so we could combat cancer by destroying or inhibiting the telomerase. Sure. So a lot of people think that telomere shortening is a really important part of aging. But that's actually pretty much been rejected by the gerontology field now. And I think that rejection is correct. I think that, in fact, telomere shortening plays only a very minor role, if any, in aging, and only in specific, very, um, very few specific tissues. The immune system may be one example, but it's an example which can be combated pretty easily because it's hematopoietic, it's um, derived from stem cells. Um, the process of cancer, therefore, is the main problem. And to the extent that telomere shortening may be a problem, or indeed that the accelerated telomere shortening that we would um, cause by inhibiting telomerase as an anti-cancer therapy would be a problem. Um, the correct approach, I think, is to go ahead and damn well do this as a way of getting on top of cancer and then to cope with the side effects uh, in whatever way seems to be necessary. Um, the conclusion I've come to is that actually it's not going to be too hard to cope with those side effects because the side effects will be seen most um, predominantly in tissues that have a rapid turnover that are maintained by stem cells, things like the blood and the gut and the skin. And these tissues are ones that, precisely because they're maintained from stem cell pools, can be maintained by the periodic replenishment of those pools using cells that have had their telomeres extended out outside the body so that they don't need to have telomerase to extend the carry-on extending them inside the body. Seems like a pretty straightforward approach. I mean, if you can just inhibit telomerase, these cancer cells are no longer immortal and become quite manageable. That's right. And people have been looking at the possibility of using drugs to inhibit telomerase um, for some time, and there's some success in that area. The problem is that if you simply do that, then the cancer cell, of course, which is an ingenious cell that's constantly mutating and thinking of new ways to grow, um, finds ways, for example, to destroy the drug or to exclude the drug or just to express more telomerase to compensate for the inhibitor or whatever. So I'm um, adopting a much more aggressive approach, which is to go in and actually delete the telomerase genes using gene targeting, the method I was mentioning a moment ago. And to do this not only in the cancer, but to all our cells, so that all our cells become absolutely unable to carry on living indefinitely. And that, of course, includes our stem cells, which is why this periodic replacement would be needed. But it's, it's, it, it seems to a lot of biologists that this would be overkill, that this would be going too far. But I feel that those biologists are not taking cancer seriously enough and that we really do need to take these extreme measures. But there would make some people nervous who think that some cells need the telomerase to overcome the telomere limitation. That's right. I mean, I think essentially what we would be doing here is what we'd be gaining is a defense against cancer that really works, and what we'd be losing is the immortality of our stem cells. So we'd be getting the requirement to go in and have our stem cells replenished every 10 years. But that's a pretty easy trade-off to make if you conclude that that's the only way you're going to be able to escape cancer for more than a few more decades. I'm involved with one project that's targeting cancer stem cells because a lot of the therapies target the cancer cells, which are like the worker bees, and the cancer stem cell is thought to be like the queen bee. It's really the source of, of new cancers. And if you wipe out, you could wipe out all the worker bees and it looks like the cancer's gone, but the uh, queen bee, the cancer stem cell, is still there to regenerate a tumor. What, how, where does that factor in? Uh? So the cancer stem cell field is a really fashionable and growing field at the moment, and there's certainly a lot more that we need to discover in this area. But at the moment, I think there are some very fundamental unanswered questions. One of them is, well, we know that cancer cells are relatively undifferentiated. Um, it may be that cells which do not exhibit a cancer stem cell phenotype are nevertheless becoming cancer stem cells by a sort of dedifferentiation process all the time. And if that's true, then just killing the cancer stem cells wouldn't be very effective. However, the main point, of course, is that it doesn't actually matter whether you only kill the cancer stem cells. The point is you definitely have to kill those cells or else it's not going to work. Um, so absolutely, I think that's correct. 
But then we have the problem that the cancer stem cells, in many, many ways, are the cells which are least different, least, least recognizable as different from the cells that are not cancerous, from our normal stem cells. And so we have a therapeutic index problem, of course, of how much of a drug you can give that's not too damaging to the real stem cells but is damaging to the cancer stem cells. That's why I think we have to take this preemptive approach of actually making the cells inherently have a time bomb in them that means that they just can't divide indefinitely. And even if we have to sacrifice the immortality of our, stem, our normal stem cells in return for that, and therefore have to go in and every 10 years have a reinfusion of various types of stem cell, that will be an acceptable price to pay. I mean, all of our cells, my heart cells, my skin cells, adult stem cells, embryonic stem cells have the same DNA. So there's some factors, some genes or signaling factors or short RNA molecules or proteins that trigger the right gene expression. So we should be able to figure out how to reprogram a skin cell to be a heart cell or an embryonic stem cell. Sure, that's right. I mean, in a way, one could say that nuclear transfer, the process that made Dolly the sheep, just shouldn't work. It's something that evolution has no particular reason to have developed. But really, if we look at it, we can see that this is simply a, a, a rather um, spectacular example of the wonderful robustness of evolved genomes, of their ability to take something that's not right and put it right reasonably well. We know that cloned animals tend not to be quite right, um, but they tend to be fairly right, given how very different their DNA was before the nuclear transfer process existed. So yes, I think that's right. And again, it's a case of using evolution's own ingenuity, even though we don't necessarily understand that ingenuity very well, just exploiting it for our own purposes. I think, really, if I had to say what the number one thing is that I try to do, both within the scientific community and within the wider world, it's to try to demystify aging, to get people to understand that aging is really just a process of decay, of the accumulation of damage, just in the same way that aging of a car or a house is, and therefore that the combating of aging is simply a repair and maintenance problem, a very boring problem. And all we have to do is figure out enough about the types of damage that we need to fix to be able to come up with the rational design of interventions that can fix them. Once you get that concept through into people's minds, whether they be scientists or journalists or um, members of the general public, then the whole thing begins to look a great deal more doable and people start listening to the details a little bit more and then they start to get optimistic. I like your metaphor of the aging of a house. Uh, I mean, our bodies are a little bit like of a house. We inhabit them. And if you don't maintain a house, it's not going to last very long. And if you maintain the house, it can last indefinitely. There are some houses that are thousands of years old. And the only difference between a house and this house that I inhabit is we understand how a house works because we built it. And we don't fully understand this house yet. One of my themes is that that understanding is proceeding exponentially. I mean, the number of amount of DNA data, for example, we've sequenced is doubled every year, and you can see this exponential growth in every aspect. So can you relate our understanding and improving understanding of, of this house, the human body, to this metaphor of gaining the means of, of fixing uh, what goes wrong? The big difference between the human body and simpler machines, man-made machines, is, just as you say, because we didn't have the plans. We don't have the plans of the human body, and the human body is also, to be perfectly honest, much more complicated than any man-made machine. Um, so that's a difference of degree. It's a quantitative difference. It doesn't mean that we are, in principle, unable to apply an engineering approach to dealing with this problem, but it does mean that it's damned hard. Um, I think another part of the difference is that because we are one evolved species out of many, many millions of species, we have the opportunity to make use of the diversity that evolution has managed to create for our own purposes, to use, well, we were talking earlier about viruses for gene therapy, for example, to use bacterial enzymes to get rid of indigestible molecules in our bodies. Um, and that process can continue for a long time um, without uh, actually getting necessarily a particularly comprehensive understanding of how the body works. I always like to talk about the process of sidestepping our ignorance of our own bodies. 
because I think it is fair to say that we are still fabulously ignorant about how biology works, about how cells work, let alone how organisms work. I often take the example of RNA interference, which we now know is an absolutely fundamental aspect of the way that cells actually work, and yet it was completely unknown as little as a decade ago when we thought we more or less knew everything about DNA and RNA. So, um, yeah, there's a long way to go before we understand things, but that doesn't mean that we can't start developing interventions. Where do you see the role of uh, non-biological interventions? I mean, there's already a whole industry of devices. The devices are getting smaller. You can put a pea-sized computer in your brain if you have Parkinson's disease, and it's programmable from outside the patient. There are at least experiments in animals, a few dozen different experiments of putting blood cell-sized devices. One cured t type 1 diabetes in rats, and another can cut down cancer cells in animal experiments. And, uh, there are devices being developed for humans that you can put in the GI tract that, that do therapeutic uh, interventions. So the, the whole panoply from artificial hearts and lungs and to replacing just about every system in the body with non-biological approaches. I think non-biological approaches are going to play an increasing role in the maintenance of longevity escape velocity. My gut feeling is that we will achieve that tipping point without significantly greater use of non-biological um, tools than we're using at the moment. You know, the occasional thing that may involve a replacement to organ will continue to happen, but they will play a relatively minor role in actually getting to longevity escape velocity. But staying there, increasing the comprehensiveness of these therapies um, and buying more time faster than we are actually consuming that time, that will be a progressively harder problem, and we will increasingly run up against the inherent limitations of what proteins can do. So. I think that nanotechnology will eventually play a dominant role. Do you personally look forward to getting to that tipping point, that escape velocity, where at least the likelihood is the further out you go, the actual more life expectancy you have? And I, I certainly look forward to the day when we actually have age-related death and age-related debilitation under control just the same way as people look forward to the day when we have AIDS under control or malaria in Africa under control and so on. Ultimately, that's the fundamental reason I'm in this business is to save lives. I mean, some people really get upset when you talk about uh, overcoming death or, or even just significantly extending life, that short lifespans, death gives meaning to life because it makes time precious. Uh, it's a very fundamental issue. Uh, in my view, at least one purpose of religion has been to rationalize death as a good thing because we really didn't have much alternative because we're kind of up until fairly recently stuck with death. It was very uh, unlikely to, to envision that being overcome within one's lifetime. The ways that people use to defend against aging, I don't really actually regard it as a philosophical issue. I regard it purely as a psychological issue. The the whole process of aging has been well known for quite some time to be rather ghastly, um, but yet also to be completely inevitable. And of course, if you're faced with something that's ghastly and it's inevitable and it's going to make your life miserable and then kill you, but not for quite a long time, then you've got a choice to make. You've either going, you're either going to um, be preoccupied by it and have it you know, get you down, or you're going to try and put it out of your mind and get on with your miserably short life in order to make the best of it. You know, so it's perfectly rational to adopt arbitrarily irrational arguments for defending aging and coming to the conclusion that it's actually quite a good thing after all. But of course, now that we're in the situation where we may be within range of, of creating the possibility to live indefinitely long, this becomes an enormous part of the problem because people have this entrenched ambivalence and this you know, resolute reluctance to actually even think rationally about these questions. I mean, how much do you run into resistance from people that are just offended, you know, probably because of influence of these ancient ideas. Because, I mean, humanity has spent enormous amount of time and effort developing philosophies to accommodate death and therefore turn it into something positive. And uh, so pe some people get upset at the idea that uh, we could change that natural order. I think there's been a, progress, a succession of examples in history where new technologies came along that 
on the face of it, were obviously a good thing, you know, hygiene or in vitro fertilization or, um, you know, the Industrial Revolution. And indeed, they did in some cases cause some turbulence um, in, uh, you know, in society when they were brought in, but ultimately we wouldn't uninvent them. I mean, one of the arguments I encounter is, well, isn't this going to lead to overpopulation? We're already running out of energy and resources and water and so on. And well, I mean, how do you respond to that? I like to give both, both a specific and a general response to the overpopulation concern, which actually I find is the one that comes up most often. Um, the specific response, well, actually, give, you tend to give a range of specific responses. But one thing I point out is we've got a rapid decline in the birth rate in the industrialized world, especially in the affluent societies within the industrialized world already. And furthermore, that's mainly being driven by the professionalization and emancipation of women who are not simply having fewer children, they're also delaying having those children until it's then or never, so to speak, until menopause in, and um, you know, the prospects of, of aneuploidy and Down syndrome and so on beca become significant. Uh, now, if we were able to fix all that, if we were just able to eliminate um, the decline in either the ability or the safety to have kids I at a later age, um, then I think it's a fair bet that women would continue to delay a lot having their children, and therefore we'd see an acceleration of the decline in the birth rate. Now, of course, this only, only applies strongly to the professional uh, um, components of society, but those are increasing all the time. We see, for example, China already has moved to a below replacement level of fertility, and India is plummeting and nearly down to that level. So I would say that at this point, the prospects are pretty good that we will not face an overpopulation problem anyway. However, that brings me to my general answer, which is that even if we did, or even if we thought that we probably would reach a Malthusian crisis of one sort or another with a problem with resources, we still shouldn't be using that as a reason to hesitate to develop these therapies because ultimately that would be to deny our, our descendants the choice whether to go with the low death rate and the low birth rate or to go with the high death rate that we have now and the high birth rate. They can always choose not to use these therapies. One of the objections I sometimes get is people say, well, yeah, we can extend how long people live, but there's a natural limit, just as a basic limit biologically to how long humans can live. But what do you say to that? The concept that there's a basic biological limit to how long people can live or how long other organisms can live for that matter is, again, one of the assumptions that it's easy to dispel just by pointing out that the body is simply a very complicated machine and therefore that maintaining it and repairing it can extend its life. If we look at machines like cars, for example, or houses, they have a natural limit to how long they live, which exists so long as we only do incomplete repair and maintenance, or rather, shall I say, inadequate repair and maintenance. If the repair and maintenance, repair and maintenance is sufficiently comprehensive, then we don't have a problem. So that's why, in order to keep, for example, a VW Bug going for 50 years or a vintage classic car going for 100 years, you need to do more than normal. Um, but we can do that. It's just that it takes specialist knowledge. So the specialist knowledge that we need to transcend the supposed biological natural limits on human lifespan is really simply the technology that we need to transcend the biological lower limit on lifespan, the, li the, the limit that we have been given by nature. Another objection or concern I get is, okay, we'll develop these things, but they're going to be very expensive and only the rich can afford it and it's going to exacerbate the have, have not divide. What's your feeling about that? I think the history of technology shows us that technologies that are really important to people do tend to be very expensive when they first come along, but precisely because they're so important to people, and so long as they stay important, there's an enormous market pressure to make them cheaper and more convenient and more effective as time goes on. I think in this case, we'll actually have that process in a particularly accelerated form because there will be a period, perhaps as much as well, I would say at least 15 or 20 years, in fact, during which everyone will know that these technologies are coming, in contrast to the situation we have now where people are still able to pretend that they will never come. And that period of anticipation of the technologies will be the time when all the hard economic decisions and political decisions are made that are geared towards minimizing the period of incomplete access to these therapies when they do arrive. Some thinkers like Andrew Weil said our goal should be healthy aging,
and not extending life. I sort of feel healthy aging is an oxymoron, but how, how do you respond to that uh, view? I absolutely take the view that the concept of successful aging is a contradiction in terms, that aging is a system failure and nothing could be more ridiculous than to define a concept of successful aging or healthy aging. I think to define it as a short-term goal, to say, well, okay, at the moment we don't have technologies that can seriously impact aging, therefore let's do our best to postpone the decline as much as we can, that's a fine goal. Promises of immortality have occurred throughout history, and so that's a reason for skepticism. Oh, we've heard this before. So, so what's different? One of the things that I found most frustrating, actually, about the way in which the media have um, discussed my work is that even in quite high highfalutin publications, they will always use the word immortality or the phrase living forever to describe what I'm trying to aim for. And in other words, to deliberately um, conflate the concept of infinite lifespans with the concept of indefinite lifespans. Um, and I've got used to that, and I sort of laugh at it now. But the fact is, I think it's done on purpose, not necessarily consciously on purpose by journalists, but by people in general. The, if, if you deliberately confuse immortality with the elimination of aging, then what you're doing is you're confusing something that we know is impossible. It cannot be um, achieved by human means with something that we... Are, we might have actually achieved by human means. And that, of course, is another example of the pro-aging trance that I've been talking about so much, the idea that we're trying to put out of our minds the possibility that we might be able to do this so that we can cling to the idea that it's actually a good thing that we can't do it and thereby not think about all these things. What about going beyond biology, the, the whole vision articulated by the transhumanist movement? I don't really know whether I'm a transhumanist. I have been rather amused to discover that the word actually has multiple definitions. I think I'm perhaps reasonably well described by Huxley's original definition of transhumanism, which was to do with man remaining man, but transcending himself periodically or, or continuously, as opposed to the definition that Max Moore put forward in perhaps 15 years ago um, to do with becoming post-human. I, I, I'm... I'm ambivalent about whether I'm really a transhumanist. For example, I personally find it quite easy to imagine that in uh, the perhaps not even ridiculously distant future, we will be able to understand the workings of individual neurons well enough to be able to build non-biological neurons that are the size of neurons and progressively to incorporate them into the brain over a period of time maybe, such that the newly incorporated neurons would learn from the old ones, whether the biological ones or the previously incorporated ones, and eventually one would end up with a non-biological brain that was working in just the same way as our current brain does, but which would be considerably more resistant to being hit by trucks. And this strikes me as rather an attractive approach because even though I'm a pretty unambitious when it comes to things like replacing my body with virtual reality, I think I actually quite enjoy being made out of meat. Nevertheless, I don't actually have a particular emotional attachment to what my brain's made out of. So, you know, it, it's horses for courses. I think everyone has their own particular hang-ups about pro progress, but they don't really slow one down. So you like the pleasures of the flesh that you can actually feel, but whether the brain is made out of biological neurons or some computational substrate that could be backed up, uh, that, that's okay. It's a piecemeal thing, rather like fixing the initial suffering of aging at the moment, aging being a piecemeal thing. I think that the ways in which our acceptance of technologies that constitute the merging between biology and non-biology go along will also be piecemeal and it will differ from one person to another. I don't think that that's going to cause problems. I think it will be considered to be perfectly normal to have you know, people, some people be different and to adopt new technologies sooner than others. I think some of the ethical objections are in fact to the very nature of going beyond human limitations. I'm not even yeah. sure that that's true. The reason I'm not sure is because ultimately when one asks in detail about particular examples, one tends to come up with rather fine lines, for example, whether the change is permanent in the body or whether it can be, you know, it, whether it's like something you can put on and take off, like, you know, wings, for example. Uh, it's perfectly okay to get in an aeroplane, but apparently, or to use a hang glider, for example, but apparently it's not okay to grow your own wings, things like that. These are rather subtle distinctions, and the more one gr g delves into the details, the subtler they get, and so this is why I don't really take the the 
um, fundamental ethical basis of these objections at all seriously. I think the singularity of longevity is fairly near, probably. I have to be very speculative because I don't think it's really near. I think we have a 50% chance of reaching what I like to call longevity escape velocity within about 25 or 30 years, subject to good funding of the preliminary research over the next 10 years or so. But I think a 50% chance is quite enough to be working hard towards. <laughs>